Oh, great. Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, this is the last but not the least keynote of this year's conference. Um, after this keynote, there is still, uh, the program continues. So there will be another uh, panel and uh, closing remark. Uh, but as far as keynotes, um, this will be our last one. And we are happy that you're here joining us. I want to give a special thank you to Rose um, for what Peggy Pisha in the first keynote called creating and holding uh, this black space. So um, Rose, thank you so much for uh, the many years of kindness and nurturing that you have enriched all of our lives with. Uh, many, including me specifically, would not have had the platform we have today if it was not for your love and uh, your belief and your commitment. Uh, for many years, you have created this space where Black joy, despite pain, can flourish. Um, big thank you to the rest uh, of the BGHRA team for all the hard work that you've put into this year's conference. Um, your creativity and professionalism uh, really shines through every session. Um, it's truly an honor to be here today and have a chat with the amazing Jerry Hoffman. Um, his short film, I Am, is still available to our conference attendees. And if you have not seen it yet, I promise you, you will want to. We will be discussing the short film in detail today. Uh, so please take this as your... Spoiler alert, uh, we will be going in. Uh, but first, let me introduce Jerry Hoffman to you. Jerry Hoffman is a writer, director, and actor with German and Ghanaian roots. His various short films were hugely acclaimed and screened at numerous international film festivals. I am one, the HBO Max Best Short Film Award at the Martha Vineyard's African American Film Festival. It was a finalist at the 2021 Student Academy Awards and illustrates Jerry's artistic flair for bold and immersive storytelling and his commitment to amplifying Black talent and perspectives. A member of the German Film Academy, Jerry is a fierce and vocal advocate for greater representation on and off screen. He has used his platform to address the lack of diversity in European film and TV. His thesis on the history of structural racism in German film and theater earned him the prestigious Fulbright Scholarship and a place to study film production and directing at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. As an actor, he just wrapped up the film The Next Level and can be seen in the Turkish Netflix series Yakamos S245. He can also be seen in the Netflix film Heartbreaking Agency and a vampire series for Amazon called Beasts Like Us. His passion lies in telling inclusive and empowering stories that have been previously overlooked and bringing visually cinematic narratives to the screen in a new, innovative, and exciting way. Jerry Hoffman is represented by Creative Artist Agency. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us today. Wow, what a what a wonderful introduction. I mean, um, I'm beyond grateful to be here. I also have to to um, lean into your thanks to Rosemary to opening up this space. I'm I'm so glad that I'm just stepping in and and becoming a friend of the conference. But also, I really have to say thanks to you to you because you I think reached out 
I think one and a half years ago, two years ago, because you saw the shorts on a festival and I was beyond thrilled and grateful that there's this um, wonderful person somewhere in the US reaching out because she saw the film and to see how stories can travel and we stayed in contact and now we finally can talk about it. So thank you so much for opening this space, having all the kindness all this time and um, being in there with me. Thank you. Yeah, um, this this film really blew my mind and um, it continues to do so. And I've watched it like so many times now um, and always find something new, you know, because after watching it once or twice, your eyes start to drift into different corners of the screen and there it, the the mise en scene is just packed with with <laughs> amazing things to take note of little Easter eggs like little things to find and then it's also just you know Sherry Hagen she's just she just makes me melt she there's something so 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 special about her performance her eyes and and and, and her voice is just so fangirling over Sherry. <laughs> Um, I, I kind of want to jump right into it. How how was it working with someone like Sherry Hagen? Incredible. I mean, both of these actresses, um, it was just a gift. And also having these three generations of, of um, Black filmmakers. I mean, Melody, who just came in, who was the youngest, and Sherry, who works in the industry for, I think, 20 30 years successfully and i was in the middle so having these three generations when we rehearsed of of black actors actresses in my case then directing looking at the industry looking at race looking at the characters i was i was always like um humbly thankful for everything because I feel like I wouldn't be here if not for Sherry who opened up a space for the German film industry and for German filmmakers to 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 be present to be seen to always be um, vocal and so it was like a gift but um, I mean the whole casting process I'm still I'm still thinking about the easter eggs but I will answer this question later but um, the whole casting process was just I think I told you that we previously were supposed to do another script, then the worldwide pandemic hit and we were not able to because we had elderly people and we had club scenes and everyone was like, you, you're you not going to be able to shoot this. So we were like, okay, what, what can we do in a time where a worldwide pandemic hit and you're at an art university? So for all of us, it's like, should we go to hospitals? Should we help? Is, it, if, is there any reason to now do a short film? Um, so we had these moral issues um, and then we quickly decided on we want to do our thesis because it's like the the, 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 the final and the only um, constellation that we'll be able is two actresses or actors and one location and then my producer my film producer who's wonderful and the great friend Stella Flicker was like women and I said black and then we, we said like the frame is like oh my god and I said let's not be boring so um we brainstormed a lot about stories and whatever and then um quickly this um, idea arose about um black android being found somewhere in the future in Germany and the amazing author wrote the script and when we then send it to like producers and also broadcasters to get more funding they were like it's an amazing script but how are you going to find these women and this stuck because it took some time to understand the racism behind the idea of not being able to find talented beautiful versatile actresses and then I had the great casting director I mean this is the whole shebang now but I had the great casting director Lisa Stutzky who was very keen into finding talent and not only resisting on because agency have such agencies in Germany have such a lack of representation that there's so little blackness within the I mean it's changing now it changed also I, I hope with this film or or during the time of the film but we sent out a casting invitation and had 160 
um, auditions of the most amazing, wonderful women from so many different ages, from Austria, Germany, and um, Swiss. And I was crying in front of the laptop because, first of all, I'm, I, I'm working in the industry as a Black actor for 12 or 14 years. I haven't seen half of the actresses so everyone was like they are not there and they don't exist and I was like they do exist they're just not giving chances to play the lead play complex characters and I was also very touched that I mean it was a worldwide pandemic some many of these women had families including children we are not we were not supposed to pay anyone this was this is the high school law so we're not supposed to pay anyone so everyone coming into this project was working for free for two weeks in a worldwide pandemic and like in this casting auditions you felt such an urge to be part of this project which had to do with the lack of complex characters the lack of complex science fiction genre characters so that was the whole um, story. And then we had the most amazing casting and even even in the live casting. I mean, at that time, we were supposed to, the actresses were not allowed to touch each other. So there was the, a, a thin plastic line between them, like a, like a kind of a canvas, because at that time you were afraid about um, um, getting COVID in the room. It was all a bit ridiculous in a way. I mean all respect but I had to wear gloves and <laughs> it felt like so so outdated in a way but we had an amazing casting and it was very clear from the beginning that they were perfect for each other yes that's a long answer to the one question how it, how we came to Sherry Hagen but we were so glad to have her wow that's amazing um I did not know yet I didn't know that you had to keep the, the some sort of barrier between the actresses but did that continue throughout the two weeks of the filming of of I am that there was some sort of barrier or was that just in the beginning or during the casting or auditioning no I mean this was uh, our thesis movie so it was a high school film and at that time the rules for film productions and universities were kind of we were somewhere in the middle between a professional production and a university and for a university who doesn't have physical contact and most other spaces you can just do zoom or whatever if, if for, for a shoot and for an audition it's not always possible or doesn't lead up to the same results so we were always in between the rules who we were constantly changing out of the necessity and the awareness and also fear of of um, um i mean at that time the fear was different um concerning um COVID and also the spread and the respect to it. And so we were always updated every week and what we allowed and what we're not allowed. But in, um, it, particularly at the week when we did the auditions, it was super, super strict. And so, of course, everyone had to get tested, which is super reasonable. And also that you have some distance, but it's hard to play and interact with each other in a room if you have like the, the line. For the shoot, we decided on a, I mean, we had to do a hygienic and healthcare concept that was, that was part of the time. So you have to have concept, you have to have one person who was the only person who were allowed to be paid um, to as part of the project and then see how to, how, how this is um, uh, resolved and also checks in. And the concept was that we all did a quarantine set up so we all moved to the woods for the three weeks and hadn't hadn't had any outside contact um, but the actresses were only supposed to touch each other 10 to 15 minutes on the shooting day if they are tested the two days before so that was then it is it's so interesting because it it, it informed the film um, I mean, we decided to to assume that everyone saw the film, so I hope we don't spoil too much for everyone who hasn't. But um, between these women and a human, and an, I always call it inorganic being, so an organic and an inorganic being, there's such a way of um, distance, copying, closeness, 
can we interact or not? And so having the rule that they are not allowed to touch each other on set created another dimension of um, energy because normally you always um, are aware of the other body when but when there's a rule as an actor it's it's amazing i feel like it, it increases creativity because they sometimes were like when when sherry was moving melody was moving again because she was like we're not supposed to touch each other so but they were also i mean um in the opening sequence in the beginning scene sherry hagen's character noe eats a soup and the rule at that time was that she's not allowed to eat the soup if someone else makes it. So she had to eat, to make the soup in the kitchen of the house herself so no one touched it. <laughs> so it was like these times. But um, yeah, we took it with the most respect and humor and um, recognition to to um, health of our society. So, And we even tried to incorporate it in the story. Yes. That's fascinating. Um, let's, for, for those who, who have not seen the film, maybe now is, because if they have not seen the film, they're like, what, what are these two people talking what about? Are these, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so maybe now is a good, uh, moment to show the trailer um, and then we'll 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 jump we'll jump into us talking again. So I'm going to do this here. Träumst du nachts? Wer hat dich geschaffen? Wer hat dich geschaffen? Du bist ein bisschen Mensch. Ich bin ja kein Mensch. Ich hab dich gern. Wieso kopierst du mich? Du musst keine Angst haben. Alles in Ordnung? Alles in Ordnung? Don't leave. Ich will träumen können. All right, I hope everybody was able to see that well. Um, I mean, yeah, the trailer. Uh, it's, I have so many thoughts and questions in my mind. So let me try to get organized. Um, what is I am about in, in, in your own, in your own words? That's such a big question in a way. Um, I feel you could answer it on different levels. When we talk about structure, uh, story, plot, it's about a woman who is alone in the woods somewhere in the future of Germany, um, sets out for a walk and finds a lifeless black female body, takes it home and finds out it's an android. And then there are weird, beautiful strange relationship um, evolves but to me personally and i felt the beauty of this film is that everyone in the in the heads of department the author the producer the dp everyone kind of found their own answers also what the film is about because it has it's it's there's something between this different plot points between there's something in between to me it was always about worth i am meaning i am means i belong i'm worthy i i exist and for an android 
supposedly created to serve the needs of which is not part of the story but was always our backstory of a white man in a very submissive way overcoming her programming of being submissive and serving into acknowledging wait a second i can be i can be something i can be worthy of something um this transition was for me always the center of the film but of course it's also about copying it's about artificial intelligence it's about blackness it's about loss a lot um noe the human character um lost her sister due to a drug overdose and so having another being coming into that space while she's still mourning so this was also part of it so i feel there's a lot of copying but if i have to narrow it down it's worth self worth and uh, yeah empathy the the theme of of worth is um really i agree with you really central like throughout the film and um is is questioned um or becomes a question too of of who who whose worth um is who is worth more uh there 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 is a point in towards the end of the film where um Ela our android or or how did you in organic being what did you organic say? being so she's the organic being she's the inorganic being inorganic and... being yes where she where she questions our organic beings worth um and the worth um, of black women in and the questioning of that worth uh in our society is um it, it this question in the film mirrors this this question that we have in our society as well and um the the worth of black women in the film industry um as well you 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 make a obviously you make a conscious decision to to pick these two actress actresses and they have such they have such great chemistry as well so i i'd like to know you know um what well i'd like to know so much but i'd like to know what made what made you choose these two from the 160 um actresses that 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 came knocking um and answered your call um why why these two uh, and they have such great chemistry did you how how did you instruct them um to in addition to the COVID uh, protocol that you have to follow, how did you instruct them to interact with one another? With one another. So why Melody, why Sherry, and how much instruction did you have to give them to, to yeah, to be with one another? I mean, the process was more intense at the end we had 160 audition tapes from the people that we already um, invited but so we saw so many more other actresses and actresses we looked at theaters we looked at um, agencies of course model agencies sometimes we were like I, I was always open to have also people who are in Germany we call it lion who are first-time actors who have not this much experience because I feel very confident in helping someone um through the journey because I come from acting. So it was like, it's totally fine to have someone who has no experience. I want the best actresses and actors. And so when we had the 160 audition tapes, it was, I mean, there were so many great auditions and as casting 
it's always a process and I take it very seriously. Everyone is very different on that. But to me, casting is, I feel like 60%, especially in a film where you only have two beings. It's all about their chemistry. It's all about how they translate what is in the screen, uh, what is in the script from through the screen to the audience. So it's so important to find the right ones. And we took it quite um, serious. I just remember, I mean, Melody's audition tape was just marvelous. She, I haven't seen her yet. Now she's, a, also after that, she was nominated for um, for the First Steps Award and is now doing a lot of wonderful, great projects also internationally. But at that time, I, I didn't know her. And um, so I saw her for the first time and she, her slang was very much like, um, it was so cool. She was like, hi, Melody, what's up? And so you're like, is she able to pull it off as an Android? So yeah, yeah, okay, I will try it. I don't know. I don't know if I spill it. Hi, how are you doing? And suddenly she just transformed completely already there, there and then. And so I was like, oh my God. Um, we had quite some others, but that was like really, really intense and great and something that you cannot um, give. Um, but of course, at the end, it's chemistry. So we only also, to, to the respect of um, COVID, we limited down to the smallest amount. And I think we had six actresses, three for the role of Ela and three for the role of Noé that we tried in different constellations, but not all constellations. I mean, it's also like, also ha ha the constellation has to work. And um, when we came to Ela, there was always this idea, this android could have worked in different attitudes, tempers, and ages also. If you make this android, if you cast it super young, I mean, Melody was more on the younger side, but there were also even younger uh, um, characters. And the other character is supposed to be older. It creates more of the mother-daughter relationship. The closer they get, it's more uh, sisterhood or two women sharing a friendship or whatever. So it was also about their what they project as an energy, how much they, oh, yeah, what it is. And then there was like, I mean, the audition between the two was just it was spark and as you said you, you, we call it all image uh, we call it um, chemistry but it's the it was vibrant and chemical and something that you this is why i'm so 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 keen about live auditions there's something that you cannot make up your mind with so it was yeah great and incredible and then which is also rare especially for student productions i'm very keen on rehearsals which is not always easy to bring into it. It costs money to have like a rehearsal space, to bring in the actresses, to set the time. So I think we had a week of rehearsals, which to me was very important, especially for the portrayal of the Android. So many people were like, oh my God, you have an Android and it's a science fiction story, but how, how are you going to, to do it? <laughs> how are you going to show it's an Android? And I was always a keen acting. You can do it with acting. But then, I mean, Melody brought so much, but we, we really put a lot of work into the transition. I mean, if you look over the film, over the roughly 30 minutes from the beginning where she just woke up from her standby mode to, hi, how are you? To at the end where she's almost human in a way. It's like, why can't I be as worthy as you? And also brings in some, some um, attitude where you could question if this is something she copied from the human she saw or is this her real identity but there's like a, a transition and we pulled it down into I think five different stages of how much is she and also how much do you want to do it in RTD2 in Star Wars it's like hello how are you it's like it, it could be easily something that brings you, uh, brings you out of the story but on the other hand you want to really believe that this is a machine and so this is uh, this is how the process was and it was a lot of, lot, of, lot of fun to go into also physical work and and how 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 do you portray it what is it what how does it feel to have um to have metal in your hole that you are inorganic how how does it feel where is your voice constructed if there's a little i mean if, if it's not human and so it was interesting and um 
I'm so grateful that Melody, Melody threw herself in. So trustful, yeah. I hope this answers the question. Yeah, I there. Um, it's it's very interesting to think of different constellations because they're the moments between these two women inorganic or organic uh, uh, at times quite tender um, and, and also loving. And then also there are moments uh, that are tense. Um, so I, I couldn't decide really if, um, if I saw this like budding relationship as a sisterhood or as a relationship between a mother and a daughter, or um, if it might not also be possible to read this in a queer way, where especially at the end, um, the dancing is quite romantic and quite sensual. Um, do you think one could also read this in, in a queer way? Absolutely. I mean, not only the relationship, but also the topics of um, worth being the other and not feeling seen are really queer topics. Um, I was always interested in having space and leaving it open. I mean, and is this a mother-daughter relationship? Is this a sister relationship? Is this um, 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 is there a family dynamic, a friendship, or a love story? And I felt it's all of it because this this is the beauty of having a short where you don't have to answer all the questions. I'm not sure if I could will ever be able to have this um, this openness because only in a short film it's it's okay to leave out so many answers and still be hooked in a way but um i think it's all of it um really especially i mean there was something beautiful you said earlier that i just thought about that especially black women but i feel like when we talk about worth there's so many different attributes that we put on certain body types mental abilities sexual orientation skin colors that and we all know it i mean i don't need need to um, make the hierarchy but we all would know the pyramid of who is at the top and who is at the lowest in most of the economic chains and including the film industry who is seen whose story can we tell whose story will maybe sell or not and so that's something that is was very important to me that this film and the story is about empathy and so for me having empathy with an inorganic being is like the epiphany of empathy so whenever we feel like someone is other we should imagine them um i feel this is uh, um tara brach is a wonderful Buddhist and, and meditation teacher and she always works with imagining the other as yourself whenever you're like this community this country this whatever is other and so this is I think where empathy works but it becomes even harder if you're thinking about a living machine like your laptop how can I create empathy with something that is not even human and so starting the film from a point of view of Noé, and which is also structurally, and when we talk about um, the storytelling and filmmaking, that you most of the time want to tell a story through one particular protagonist, through the whole story. That's what you always learn at film school. In this film, we shift. At the beginning, we look from the human to the android and see this weirdness and distance towards this being that has no worth. And also Noé, I mean, Sherry, as Noe plays it so wonderful and being like, I mean, there's the first dialogue um, where she's like, who built you? And the android is like, I don't know, who built you? And like this, you feel like the worlds couldn't be more different in understanding the other. And so there's the whole transition to that over the time of the film, suddenly we turn into Melody's, Ela's perspective. And to a point where I always hoped and, and um, 
I always hope that at the end you feel for the android, whereas at the beginning you were like, I'm afraid and scared and it's spooky. And so um, I think that's that's um, the transition. Yeah. Ah, yeah. And you talked about the dance scene. That's to me, that's kind of the turning point in the whole story of these two beings feeling so distant and being um, even afraid of the other that suddenly through dancing in this moment where the android learns to move as a human and um, it changes and the story changes and also the perspective. Yeah. Yes, yes. The So the first dance scene, the slightly awkward dancers both both dancers in uh in that scene um are slightly um awkward and and perhaps that you know um corresponds to uh how they feel around each other um still when then the last dance scene uh, at the very end, which part of the trailer also portrayed in, in the beautiful white gowns, um, shows their movements are not at all awkward anymore. They're they're very they're they're very smooth and elegant. Um, there's still some mimicry that's happening in that dance scene as well, but that's uh, what I what I thought like added to the romance as well. Um, so I I really love how you connect um, these two bodies via dance. Um, there isn't a question there yet, but it-, it, it... I can still answer it if you want. <laughs> still answer. No, I, I um, yeah. I, dreams are also part of the film. And the concept, which is like a, when we look into science fiction and artificial intelligence and the stories, it's like, how does an Android dream is something that is, has been there for, for many years. And I was like, if an Android, like nowadays ChatGPT is able to access all material that is there, why wouldn't she mix up a dream that is between Disney and the Beyonce music video? That was always how I pitched it. I want to have a Beyonce music video and um, Disney. How how absurd in this at the end that they are even, you could even describe it as a marriage. Like how they the two beings are dancing in these gowns feels very much like a um, Disney princess marriage in a way. And so how, how this translates to um, androids and machines dreaming and what is real and what is a dream. And also at the end, the question is if she's dying at the moment when we see the images of a dream or if this is her first dream and she's able to continue her life. So is this only the short circuit of when life exits? And so I, 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 yeah, I loved playing with that actually. It was really, it was really a lot of, a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, one of our um, audience members had a question that's fitting here at the moment and um, everybody please feel free to add your questions to um, the, Q&A as well. Um, Madeline uh, asks if, um, well, she says that, um, I'm curious as to why science fiction was the genre you chose to tell the story through. What affordances you think this genre gave you and whether you were at all inspired by frameworks of Afro Afrofuturism and or cyborg feminism. Thank you and keep up the great work. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Madeleine. That's a wonderful question. Um, first of all, I'm a science fiction geek. Um, I love sci-fi and always have been. Germans are quite hesitant in, in, in doing science fiction. When you talk to a German about science fiction, they're always like, ah, I don't like Star Wars. And then you have to... <laughs> Then you have to pull in the the, the diversity of science fiction. Uh, what, what what can science fiction be? But over the time and over the years, and especially with I am, I came also to the questions of why am I so interested in science fiction? 
which also concludes to Afrofuturism. Of course, this was part of the research visually, but also culturally. I love Janelle Monet, and I mean, she's so keen in doing her music videos in an Afrofuturistic style. And I came to to the idea, and now we're framing it into pain and joy, as this is the, the conference title, to the understanding that my pain of maybe not being the most accepted or dominant part of the society leads me into dreaming a future where a different society is possible. And as a storyteller, I love the idea of telling a fairy tale or telling another story where I feel like people, you can, for me, I, my mission is to not repeat the same images that we've that were problematic, misogynistic, racist for hundreds of years. So I was like in the realm of sci-fi and especially Android storytelling, it's mostly male leads, mostly white leads, mostly straight leads that have an issue with their, hmm, not even masculinity, <laughs> that, ha that have an issue and that's, that's the story. So having, creating a future where they are just two black women felt for, to me the most political and activistic in a way because if I would have said the story and this is leaning back to the wonderful question of Madeline of why did I choose it I mean I I didn't choose we didn't have a story and then I chose to do it in science fiction I was interested in science fiction and we we brought it together to the idea but of course science fiction always gives you the possibility of making people not reject the story if we would have said the story here and now i think there would be a lot of people who are like but this is not my world <laughs> only two black women this is not what i like it's hard or, or german whatever it's like but where is the like where is the white people so going into the future makes people um gives people the possibility to accept the story first of all and then being like oh why w could this be a reality? And why is it not a reality? And what does it do to me? Does it do? I, am I afraid? I mean, I had so many audience members who I'm so glad that they did share it, but people said that they were kind of. Hmm. One woman said when she saw the film, her first initial thought what was, "What are these women doing in my forest?" Which, is maybe problematic or sad, but I was so thankful for the openness of the sharing because I felt like this is why I made this short to create images that we haven't seen. And the German forest with only two black women somewhere in the future is something I have never seen. And so, of course, this creates sometimes hope for, for us or for, for maybe some people in this um, panel talk. For me, it creates hope, but for some people, it also creates discomfort. And the discomfort is also important because it informs you about what kind of images you're used to. So that's kind of, kind of the, I hope this answered um, your question. Was there a second part to it? I, I, I forgot. I'm sorry. I, I think you... No, I think you got it. Thank you. I mean, there's a follow-up question for you. Yeah, yeah thank you, Madeline, for that question. Um, I also um, am reminded to the beginning of our conversation where you talked about the Easter eggs. Mm -hmm. And it's so lovely that you say that you could re-watch the film because um, I was hoping for it because I was the um, nerdy director on set who was like picking the vases like uh, there's a spell there's um breakfast scenes that are repeating over and over and so we have a development within the scenes also about the images that you see and if you really clo look closely the images within um the frames change into two black women one black woman more android and human um condition and so so many people i mean it, you're always under time pressure. You always have to hurry. And so there were some people like, oh, Jerry, why are you doing this? No one will ever look at this. <laughs> and I was like, no, it has to be like this. And so I'm so glad that you 
responded to that and and um, felt that because I felt it it's important to to the story. Yeah, thank you. There, yeah, <laughs> the the women, the two women, the two sisters in in the images, in the photographs, um, in in the credits, you 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 thank. I, I believe like two people who who in real life like that's them. Um so I'd I'd like to hear more about how you came across these photographs. Um and then yes, they are moving. Um at you know in the very beginning you have uh, a photo of the, the two sisters. Um no noise place is a mess <laughs> um and in times of grief um it's very understandable how her place looks um in 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 in, in lots of other times there's it's there's also a, i i have an understanding for places being messy um <laughs> but the the it changes when ila is is there um and so do the images also change and where that specific photo of the two girls um facing each other it's uh in a larger frame like in um in the living room area right behind Noi and then it, it it changes to the other side of of the room um and and I was wondering who is changing um who is changing the images? Is it is it Ela because she's starting to take the role of the sister? Is it? I I, I just couldn't imagine it being no way. And then I also felt like the house itself, like there's still remnants of um, Noe's sister. Um, who is passed on. It, I, at one point I was thinking, is she perhaps a ghost? And does she appear at one point? And, and you know, the, the, her presence is, is, is very felt. And is it perhaps she who uh, <laughs> changes the images up? Um, but how did you, how did you come across these these two women in 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 those images? Because there's also a photo album that that we see, I think it's also them. I'm not sure because there's different ages of, of of these sisters being represented. How how did you come across like this part of the set design? I mean, all of the interpretations that you just um, mentioned are kind of valid, and I consciously left them open in a way because I felt like there's some form of strength into not answering the questions in a way. Um, I always imagined that. Of course, there's always two storylines. It's two beings, an inorganic and an organic, and both of them have their different concept on perception and consciousness. So when we look at Ela, there might be the possibility in her transition, because it's part of the story, that she wants to clean up and wants to be helpful and that she is was um, programmed to be um, a household person, which also lingers to ideas of slavery and um, butlerism so being like um, i'm cleaning i'm organizing i'm reorganizing but to a point where it's like overstepping boundaries if someone's in grief and someone is also the house is also a sanctuary sometimes you don't want to have things changing that reminds you to the person that you just lost and if someone's then i just cleaned it also has some it has some form of aggression um, into it, which I think was interesting always to the Android character. How much do we like her or how much do we dislike her? Are we afraid of her or is she trustworthy and only wants good for us? When we look into the human perspective of Noe, she is first of all in grief, but also there's forms of, I would say, paranoia and mixed realities so for her dreams visions and reality mix um throughout the film so there's also parts of is she's just is she just dreaming the changes was it cleaner than she expected it or different and so i think both is, um both um both possibilities are there and i think it's important to to leave it leave it like that when it comes to the images 
um, it's the classical pre-production we were casting these young actresses um which is kind of hard because you have to have the location already we was wanted to do photos within the location and so it was like only a short frame that we had these um uh, great um girls that were then coming in as the sisters and so we had a little photo shoot with them and then had to uh, print the photos obviously to put it then right at the shooting day <laughs> when uh, the android is finding it but of course it's about i mean probably i always imagined that noe is the first black person and the first woman that ela sees so for her it's the absolute idol throughout the whole film and copying it's like i want to be like you this informs her and i feel this is something that is so true to sisterhood where you always it's always about are we the same or not? I want to be like you. No, I don't want to be like you. This is my skirt. Give me the skirt. So like having the, the ideas of um, copying, which is also like understanding your own identity by looking at someone who is close to you. And the other thing is, of course, as we said, mother-daughter relationship in, in, in the concept of um, um, rebellion and... I feel a lot of children have the feeling that they never want to be like their parents. <laughs> it's like, I love my parents. I mean, this is great and this is great. This is bad. I would do things differently. But then over the lifetime, some might expect, uh, like realize it's like, oh my God, I'm such like my mom or I'm such like my dad. And I feel this is also part of the story. There's something about rebellion. And I thought it's important to have the visual representation of the younger sister as a reality because it's it was always a it was a huge process of how much do we give space for the third character that is not visible which is Leia um, I also love the the idea of it's all names with three letters which is Ela, Noe and Leia you could even change Leia into Ela in talking the, uh, talking about the similarities between these two and so somehow Noe loses maybe the most important person in her life her sister but also immediately gains another being that could be her sister and and processes grief through this new being that surprisingly is also um, a similar age, black and female. And so, um, yeah, that that's kind of part of it. Um, and on the other hand, also an Android, uh, Ayla is constantly absorbing and trying to understand humanity, herself, identity, rules, how to interact, how to speak, how to work. Seeing these girls like a past is also informing her in her process of, what she'll never be she'll never have a past with a different um she's not growing i mean an android is not growing an android is evolving but you always have the same body what does it mean to go through a lifetime whatever this means and not not changing so her need of changing the hair and changing her attitude is also a process of being morphing into something else yeah Yes, that's it. And also, on the other hand, I like the idea and the concept and the question, did this happen to Ella many times or is it the first time? Because Noe finds her, reactivates her, and then she's starting her programming. But did this happen a lot already? Is this um, the third or fifth round or is this the first time? And so understanding also the idea of um, maybe she has lived many lives but maybe it's her first life. Yeah. I'm happy you just took it there because I, I, uh, I wondered about uh, the question of genre as well. Um, the trailer, the trailer's eerie music and the beginning of the short film, uh, we are dropped into a nightmare, um, Noe's nightmare, and she has these nightly nightmares. Um, and 
we are in the dark uh right behind Noe and there are these moments where she in shock turns around from the very beginning of watching I am I feel I feel a little scared and I feel like it it gives as my students and how it would say it gives horror <laughs> it gives <laughs> it, it gives me um you know horror movie or horror film vibes and it's just you know we see a black woman in the woods and I I I, I love that you mentioned the audience member who who who, who asks you what are these two black women uh, what are these two black women doing in my forest or in my woods my it's so interesting because I don't have to tell you the skin color of the audience member right. and, and also and also in which country this conversation has happened. So it's so interesting to talk about perception, but la later on, yes. Yeah, and but I, you know, I wonder what the reception was um, of of this film as well here in the U.S. Because my thought is similar to that other, you know, audience members. Um, question what what, uh, what is the black woman by herself doing in the woods because <laughs> <laughs> my spidey senses tingle and I feel like this film is not going to end well for her <laughs> right <laughs> She has she has already broken um, some of like black horror film rules of going outside the house in the middle of the woods at night. Um, and, you know, my question was, where is the monster? Where is uh, the white serial killer is who I mean with monster? <laughs> where is the white clan member? Where is the white witch that lives in the candy house <laughs> luring children into her house? where where is the white woman walking her dog who will be fearful at the sight of a black woman in her woods you know and then the film ends with moments of violence and it does not go well <laughs> for no noe and we 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 see we see her we see her being shot, um, you know, and it made me it made me wonder after and while I you know continue to watch this film, should she have trusted Ela? Should she have taken her in to begin with? Because there are moments where I feel empathy for Ela, but then I'm reminded that who made Ela and who designed Ela. Um, you know, in this particular image, um, how she's dressed, her hair, um, she, she seems to appease a white Western standard of beauty with her physique, the blue eyes. Um, she, she ran away from, so she says, from being in, in servitude. And we can read into that also, you know, um, some, you know, sexual enslavement there. She ran away, but who's coming to look for her is then, again, I, at least so, so, you know, the credits tell us, tell us this, a man and the, the actor is being played by a white man as well, who's willing to kill for her or her that's not quite clear but all in all Noe is in danger um she's being surveilled because of Ela and at the end she's being shot because of Ela so I don't I'm I'm grappling with the empathy that I have for Ela and this question whether or not she has been through this and Noe is just like in the sick cat and mouse game of finding her in the woods and taking her home. So this was a long roundabout of-, of, of... It, was, it was great. I mean, it's, it's so many thoughts. I cannot be, I'm probably 
respond to all of them, but I'm not sure at the end if Noé is more horrible than the android. And I think this is what we're touching on. Um, actually, the dream sequence and the nightmare came in later in the edit, actually. It was not supposed to start with the nightmare, but then we felt like after trying and choosing a lot of things that it helps you to um, immediately pull you into the state of mind of Noe because when the story starts she already has a loss she already starts having the nightmare so having the idea also of if something that she when she finds the android is this imagination paranoia or is this happening in real so this came in but also it brings you to I feel connecting to her because you immediately are in her state of mind. And so at the beginning, you are the human woman and finding something strange where we're like, oh my God, run away and this android will kill you or not or what happens. So to the end of when Ela says, can not I be as worthy as you? Meaning, isn't the human woman more cruel than the android? She kind of repeats the enslavement. She kind of says that she's also responsible for the death of her sister. It's um, in a way not um, fully phrased, but you can assume that she's also dealing with so much guilt in a way, which is very human. Um, do androids deal with guilt? If they don't, are they better than we are? Can someone who is not good create something that is good. I mean, are humans even able to create androids that are good? And so it's all about um, our responsibility nowadays also when this is not science fiction anymore. I mean, Tesla X created, we have androids. They are interacting with us. They're mostly white or silver, um, but we already have androids in the world and they are... Um, working for us, working with us. So how much responsibility at a certain point do we have for their emotions? Um, yeah. Um, that was the one thing. And there was something else you said. I mean, you say so many beautiful things. <laughs> I mean, this film also has this, this um, energy, I feel, in talking about it because there are so much different um, um, thoughts. But I will find it later for you. Thank you. Um, uh, Spencer asked um, about the idea of it being a horror movie. Um, how much control do you have on the trailer? Uh, the picture is reflected for some as a horror movie. Is that what you wanted since there is so much more? Um, I, we always pitched it as a science fiction art house thriller with horror elements. That was like the, the pitch phrase. Um, I feel horror is part of the story, but not only horror also has different dimension. And I feel when we talk about um, blackness and neglect of human beings, there's some horror that is... I'm a huge fan of Jordan Peele, for example. Get Out, Us, um, No. He plays with the genre of horror um, in a in a in a wonderful way, but always puts black people in the center of the story, which was new before he did Get Out. I mean, it's for the horror genre, and it's the same for sci-fi. Um, so I think it it there's different forms of horror also. We be the physical violence, a violence of something having something in your house that threatens you, but also the bigger violence of who who enslaves whom. Um, I was very present when doing the trailer. I love trailer work. I, I hope I can continue to do this all my life. Um, um, sometimes in bigger productions, the director is not as involved anymore in, in trailer work. And I, I love trailers. I don't know if it, I mean, I see it as a valid idea for me the trailer wasn't pulling only the horror into it i wanted to i think a good trailer to me is always showing what i will see 
bringing you into the story but not telling everything um i also i always stop trailers after 20 seconds i cannot watch more than half a trailer because i feel like especially in the american trailers everything gets spoiled after and um also with this i we spoil quite a lot uh, but then again it's a short film so you you have to have uh, used materials but it was not the intention to make it a horror trailer or to give a feeling for a film that is different than the film that you're going to see um, if this answers the question but it was also important I mean the, that's the, the wonderful photographer Clemens Borikis who came um, on set and did this marvelous work it was so emotional important for us to have these faces on the poster and kind of almost only the faces because I don't see black women in in leading roles in at least in Germany and so with the trailer I was I was actually quite scared when sharing it I remember like before putting the share button I mean no one has seen the film they only see the trailer and I was kind of scared and I was amazed by how much love and appreciation especially from I mean from Germans from the film uh, film industry because I felt it's so different to anything that I have seen and so I was expecting people to be more like um skeptical or critical and there was so much I felt there was so much appreciation for oh my god images that we haven't seen um Germans often tend to recreate the images that they are seeing. So in Germany, if you do movies, it's like, but um, is Gisela in Bayern understanding the story? And this is something that hasn't been there yet. Whereas in the US, I feel like, oh my God, we have the story. Let's have something new. <laughs> so there's a different idea of what a new next story should be. And I feel like in Germany, we often repeat the same narratives through the same body, through the same story. And so I was a bit afraid that Germans might react to something that's so different to the images that we have seen more negative or critical but it was only love and only appreciation and be like i want to see this film and oh my god and there's something new happening and so i was so um thankful for for that and also yeah um, yeah i'm glad you 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 talked um about the reception of the film you you took this um film also to uh, Martha's Vineyard, to the African-American um, uh, film festival there. I mean, I, I didn't take it there. We applied and they gracefully invited us. So I was like so um, humble and grateful to be invited, especially by a Black-owned festival that has such a history of um, valuing Black storytellers and Black films and Black, um, I mean, blackness overall and so it was like that that my people would invite me and and at the end we were even winning the award was like great i mean this feels is the same like being in this room i feel like sometimes it's um yeah sometimes it's so important to be valued by your people whatever this means yeah but i didn't want to interrupt so no no i'm i'm i'm, I'm happy you did I, i'm i'm just uh i i how how were the conversations there? What was the reception? What was the reception like there? And congrats, you you won you won there. So yeah. what were what was some of the feedback you got? Do you remember? I mean, sadly, it was still the higher times of the pandemic. So we had so many festivals all over the globe, but we couldn't attend physically. So it's always a different feeling. Sometimes you were zooming within the audience and then you see like audience members uh, somewhere sometimes you are in a, a panel or conversations for the film but it was mostly digital so we we couldn't um, go there and I, I i hope i can go there soon but um it was wonderful i mean talking also about perception that we kind of touched when talking about the reception of the one audience member it was interesting this is always when stories travel, they are received differently, of course, because the culture is differently, the people who are watching it is differently. Um, so in Germany, and I was lucky that then later on, we were able to have screenings with audience members. Um, like, I feel like for a year, it was all online. And then finally, we had the, the audience members. Um, for, I felt like always when showing the film for Germans, they were kind of when they saw 
the beginning of the film and this black woman in this German forest or forest, there was some skepticism. You feel an audience member. They were like, mm. and then slowly they lean into the story and accept it and stuff. Whereas uh, the film was showing at the BFI in London. Um, and it was so interesting because you didn't have the, it was also part of an African diaspora festival. So there were a lot of Africans, Brits, Europeans, most of them were black, but yet there was no skepticism for the first part of the film. But when they talked German, that was the first time I was like, huh? And you felt like in the audience, they were, so it's a different perception because they were like, of course, black people can be in forests and that's a natural image. That is nothing that I haven't seen yet. So it's interesting to, to um, experience a film with different audience members and see what they react to. Where do they laugh? Where, where they're not laughing? Um, you sense, yeah, this is why I think cinema is so important to be physical because you really um, create emotion within people somewhat. So I would, um, yeah, if there's any comments or any experiences anyone had with watching the film, please feel free to share. I would love that because sometimes it's so digital. Yeah, um, there's a... A uh, question from the audience, from an uh, anonymous attendee. Thank you for this question. Um, thinking of the Quilt Water Project we learned about yesterday, I'm wondering about the role of water in your movie. There are several instances when water seems to be of importance. First, when Noe washes Ela. Two, when Noe is stepping into water during a dream. Three, the rain outside of the house. Uh, and for a dancing scene in water. Would you mind sharing some of your thoughts in deciding to incorporate water in these scenes? Were they meant to empathize, transient moments, access to the subconscious, et cetera? Oh, that's beautiful. Um, I don't know if I've ever answered this question. That's <laughs> wonderful. Um, there were so many different layers on thinking about water and liquids within the film. First of all, water is the natural antagonist to all machines. So that's something that is really present when you are um, trying to immerse into the reality of being an android, being like an android naturally cannot swim, cannot be in the ocean. And so this is something they will always, I mean, there's, different parts of an android always wants to be human so the idea is how do i get human is always i feel a concept in science fiction most of them answer it with dreaming something that is only a human can have which we have in the in the in, in the film some answer it being pregnant like the idea of pregnancy is something that an android can't have um uh, autonomy obviously but swimming is like the most i feel um, basic and raw idea of what differentiates us so the concept of um, it's something strange and even afraid but at the end you could also question when she's in the rain if she's um, if she became so human that she um, doesn't get um, um, th that the rain cannot harm her anymore um, on the other hand, water also stands for fear. To me, I feel the ocean is always something so beautiful and so giant. But on the other hand, we always uh, talk about what is beneath. And so it, it metaphorically talks about subconsciousness and um, fear, something in the dark. Um, but we have also many scenes of Noé showering. And we always had the feeling that this is one of the only places where she can kind of reflect on the loss she had. Um, she starts to sum the sound a music that reminds her of her sister. And so Ela listening to that and being not able to shower also brings this idea of I um, water is something that I need to overcome to become human. Yeah, so yeah. I hope this answered it. Thank you. Um, I, I'm happy you just mentioned the shower scene um, and the song. Um, 
because I think the first time we hear the song is in one of Noe's nightmares um, where Ela is singing the song and that's the that's the scene where she then steps into water um, and Actually, then it's yeah the very, it's the very first thing you hear um, when in the very first dream sequence this is how we started but only and we had we had three different forms of showing this song and at the beginning you only have ding, 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 which is part of the very first nightmare so we wanted to bring it into the story so that at a certain point in the story you you have the feeling i know this song or do i like <laughs> because it's so subconsciously in there it's like oh this reminds me, have I heard this already? So uh, this is why uh, it's, it's beautiful that you that you thought it's a bit later, yeah? Yeah, so so the, it's, it's mind boggling really because uh, the I think, you know, the first 20 times or so, I thought I heard it um, first when Noe sings it in the shower and then, and then I realized later, no, no, I, I, it, I'm actually hearing it before then when Noe, ha Noe has this nightmare. And now you're saying, no, no, there's even <laughs> a moment before that. So I love yeah, the because, confusion. I love it because it was, there was the goal. So I'm so happy this worked for you because it was the idea of what is consciousness? What is memory? How does memory work? And for us, it was so important that this is a song that really reminds her of her sister and that she somehow after years of having this, having not heard or played or sung this song from her ch childhood that she suddenly comes up it's like a memory that if someone ever lost someone it's suddenly you you think about moments that you haven't for a long time or imagining the person and having for, to, to having this um this how, how do you project it on a screen to not talk about it but have the same feeling for the audience so I felt like we need to repeat it so you're used to it but on the other hand still make it a mystery that you're like but what is this song and who is it related to is it related to the sister or something and so it's a very private moment of her being in the shower and and also accepting for the first time the reality of my sister's dad and I mourn her and then when the android sings it also in a very interesting moment because we see that she's observed by drones that fly there and so there was the concept of she needs to portray being human so the androids won't shoot her so she suddenly sings this song because this feels for her the most human thing you could do being in the kitchen and sing the song on the other hand for the human who feels so portrayed betrayed like noe who is like what are you doing that i mean she's changing her she's changing her attitude but this is the one that really stuck with her where she's like you are stepping over a boundary because this is private this is my song this is my sister this is my memory this is not you um so she oversteps to this point so the song has so many different meanings and it was quite um quite a process to 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 find a way to not make it too present but then present enough so it's not too much a his mystery throughout the film so i'm so glad that this worked for you because it was very important for us in the in the shower scene that you have the feeling of the song means something it means something i know it already but is it okay that it means something to me or is it from her and this this confusion about um about yeah um memory yeah, yeah and, and just like a memory right that there's there's also some some blurriness to it I, I i i keep repeating a certain part and like rewinding or rewinding to um fully make out like the words of the lyrics and i i, I can't i can't really get the entire line it's when Melody's character Ela sings it becomes like the most uh, in the kitchen it becomes the most clear you are my precious magic dot 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 and I don't know what it is it's been like on my mind guiding me through my burdens of life and I'm also wondering like what that burden burdensome 
Yeah. Burdens. Okay, putting that in my notes. Burdens. <laughs> no, I, I love it that you even. I mean, that's um, beyond receptive of going through the lines and really knowing them. So amazing. You know, so, so I was just I I was wondering who where is this song from? Like, how did you find this song? Where can I find this song? Uh, it it sounds it, it it sounds really beautiful. How did why why this song? I mean, you mentioned music earlier also for the beginning of the song, uh, for the film. There's uh, There was three artists that I was lucky to work with for three different uh, parts. Um, and Hans, who did this particular song, I also worked with him on, a, on another short film. And of course, it's we wrote it and we had to compose it because... Um, I, I felt it's uh, there's so much about legalities and also money and using a song that already exists and um, uh, uh, do, do you do you buy it or do you create it and I always think especially in science fiction it's so great to create something um, new but so um, him and I we were um, going back and forth about the meaning of the song and how can we create it different layers to it so i'm just uh, i i almost forgot how much work we put into it now it's like oh yeah we really actually composed it. um yeah we were kind of fighting in a very beautiful way about every word so it has to be a song that is kind of a child's version of um imagination and beauty and, and the history they share but when Ela sings it all the words become a different meaning and um, also burdensome life for example um, has a total different um, tone to it when an android says it and so we were trying to make a song that's believable in the storyline of Noe but also transforms in a way um, and it's also, a thin, I mean, then we had the other composer who was Rach. I mean, we had a, an, an amazing singer and composer for the dance scene, which also has um, lyrics um, that really translates to what is happening on screen between the two characters, which I sometimes love when a music becomes some kind of... Um, um, believable within the world but then also brings brings kind of subtext to it without showing to me yeah so these were the two parts that were second but all the music is done by an amazing artist daniel zeus did all the which is kind of like 70 percent of the music score like the beginning the end all the tonally voice i mean sometimes less is more we had a lot of um, we worked a lot on, on on ambient sounds also how can we create an eerie feeling with not bringing too much but also all the horror um, energies and i met him actually in my first um, film as an actor he was the composer 2010 and um, i met him there and i he's um, so talented and so successful already so i was like would you be um, willing to make music for my little student film I cannot pay and I was so thankful that he agreed to it and um, made the wonderful magic that he did wow um, yeah the, the, thanks to thanks to both of those composers it really it really adds it really adds to the film um, yeah and I, maybe Maybe I can touch base with you about the lyrics too. I'd like to like to like <laughs> look at those more and think yeah. about those scenes more. Um, there are moments where you you force the audience to view the women. Um, from the point of view of the perpetrator, of the violence that will come towards them. Uh, there, there, the, there's a moment where we are outside of the house and the uh, orb um, flying object uh, 
is recording um, Ela while she's in, in the bathroom and we see like the recording light is kind of flashing. Um, and then later on when the man is outside of the house listening to their intimate conversation, uh, the camera is positioned right behind him. So we we see we see this figure, we see a, a like long range rifle, right? Um, and again, like the audience has to take the seat of um, those who um, commit violence towards uh, Black women. And it just made me think of like, you know, especially in, in the context um, of when the film was created um, and in all these, you know, last, sheesh, like, 10 years of um, watching um, white violence um, being recorded on film, it, it seemed so, um, it seemed so familiar to, to watch black lives on a small screen being recorded and knowing that something bad is 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 going to come their way knowing that there is uh, a shooting coming black death is upon us um what what are you what are you what are you saying about Black lives in the future and this in this in this future and and violence that black women um experience in in this in this not so distant not so different future i mean always when looking into the future you have the choice to show utopia or dystopia so always we are filling the space between now and then so if i see something is it better or worse and so we were trying to um make question marks but also um present a world that has both i feel solely having two black female beings in the future is so beautiful and i always ask like why why can a future why can't we imagine a future that is black and female because we imagine so many futures that are only white and male so wh why not but on the other hand um and this is something that i, I said it again and again, that in a short film, you have the possibility to not answer all the questions. And it's always a thin line between giving enough to an audience that I don't feel I'm not following anymore. Um, so they, they, there is an actual story. And also, of course, we made so many um, concepts and had so many talks about the world. But how much do you answer in it? Um, and something I thought is beautiful to leave out and what we came up with is a world that is so much about observation. I mean, there's flying drones everywhere. We don't know where the Android is created. If it's okay to create Androids in the world, are there many? How did she flee? Um, so are they following her to bring her back or to diminish or distinguish her? Um, and so having the concept of the author always thought about that in the future, there might be a possibility where we are now leaning into it with capitalism, that all the great companies like Google, Facebook, Meta, all connect into an observation world, which we already see in China and some Asian countries, that the governments um, is observing humans and through artificial intelligence checking their gender age um, skin color profession and with this judging them and so the concept of having having a, a future that is so much about observation and um, and also gives an eerie feeling of i'm always observed i'm i, I think it suited the story but there's a, an amazing documentary i forgot the name i think it's called brainwashed um, because you always talked about the blackness of and 
uh, also the police brutality of black people, especially in the US, black men, but of course all, all genders being um, shot. But I think there's also something about the male gaze, which this documentary is amazing. It's called Brainwashed. Um, having the concept of that for years and years and years, we portray women and men differently. So we shoot a woman differently than a man because always, most of the time, there's a male director um, and a male DP shooting images for a thought male audience. And you can also apply this for, for a whiteness. So I was at a certain point questioning myself, I'm, as a man, I'm the best director for a film that has only two female leads and how can I can I kind of respectfully talk about it and so I was so glad to have the DP and the producer who was both female and having going into this discussion a lot but I feel there's so much about who is portrayed how and who is having control and power over the framing and this is something where I feel it racism and sexism when portrayed in film have overlaying topics of um of problematic stereotypes and this comes through the story this comes through dialogue but also really through framing how do you frame an image how is someone observed who is able to record whom how and the, the officer really um didn't have his recording on or not. And so, as you said, this is, I think, also part of the story, observation, surveillance, and portraying, um, yeah, certain beings differently. And also the idea of being observed and always being um, kind of followed. Thank you so much, Jerry. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, we are now at the end of our time, unfortunately, even though I could like have more questions for you. So um, I uh, want to thank uh, the BGHRA for allowing me to, to grill Jerry today <laughs> and ask him <laughs> all the questions. Thank you so, so, so much for having me and holding the space and um watching I am more than one time <laughs> and can you do it? I'm, I'm, I really enjoyed this conversation and I, um, I'm glad about this space. So thank you. Thank you.